Night Work, a Dave Brandstetter mystery, author Joseph Hansen, publisher Open Road Integrated Media, narrator Eric Aust. Chapter 5. The high wall around the grounds of the Gifford place was almost invisible under matted honeysuckle vine. So were the pillars that held the tall iron gates. It took time to locate an intercom outlet among the leafage. The outlet looked new. It probably had to be replaced fairly often. He pressed a rectangular white plastic button. From here, because the trees were large and shaggy, he couldn't see the cupola where he supposed DeWitt Gifford sat beyond the gates. The grounds were neglected. Oleander's tallest trees crowded the drive, dropping the last of their blossoms. Pink, white, roses bloomed, blousy on long canes and flower beds, rank with wild oats and milkweed. Dark ivy covered the ground and climbed the tree trunks. The intercom speaker crackled. I'm busy. The voice was an old man's brittle. Who are you? What do you want? Dave told him the snappishness went out of the voice. Oh, yes, of course. How oh, very gentlemanly of you to come. Please wait. Uh, the wait was a long one. Dave spent it in the car. That seemed the best way to guard the car. The sun beat down. He lit a cigarette, but it tasted dry, and he put it out. He wished for a fresh glass of Mrs. Prentice's lemonade. Below him lay the roofs of Gifford Gardens. Drab gray, drab green, drab red. Under a drab brown sky, he located the big rubber tree that marked the Kilgore School, the walnut grove where the church steeple rose, the pepper trees on Gawala Street. Elsewhere in Gifford Gardens, trees were scarce. The developers in 1946 had bulldozed the oaks. Now dogs began to bark, and big dogs by the sound of them. Dave got out of the car. Down the drive, beyond the gates, came a motorized invalid's chair. The wire spokes of its wheels glittered in the darts of sunlight through the oleanders. In the wheelchair rode an old party in a tattered pitcher hat. Across blanketed knees lay a rifle. The pitcher hat was a, a woman's faded purple, decorated with bunches of wax grapes and cloth grape leaves. But the rider in the chair had a long white beard and long white hair. Mr. Brinstetter, he twitched a smile of white dentures through the whiskers. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. He stopped the chair, peered fearfully through the gates, up and down the street, and then set the rifle aside and began with a rattle of keys to undo padlocks that held thick chains in place where the two gates came together. I have no one to help me right now. The television tells me constantly that unemployment today is a national disaster, yet no one seems to want to work. How much do you want to pay? Dave asked. Ha <laughs> ha! You put your finger on it, haven't you? The last of the chains rattled and hung loose. They think I'm rich. He scraped a key around on the lock plate of the gates. The hand that held the key was bones under dry. A brown spotted skin and the hand was not steady. They want ten dollars an hour, don't they? And if they can't have ten dollars an hour, they'd rather steal. Thank you. Gifford cranked the key around and the lock. I'm talking about the blacks, of course. The Hispanics already have jobs. They know what real hunger is. And there are no food stamps in Mexico. Gifford caused the chair to move a couple of feet. His breath came in gas as he dragged at something inside the gates. A bar. And the sound of it said it was thick and heavy. There now. Gifford picked up the rifle and backed the chair out of the way. Just push, please. And they pushed. Sirens went off. Bells clamored. The old man in the great pet grinned and yelled. Something Dave couldn't make it out. Gifford pointed a bony finger at the Jaguar. He made a summoning gesture with a skinny arm. Dave ran out to the car, got inside, fumbled to get the key into the ignition. He waited for Gifford to roll to the side of the drive out of the way and then pulled the Jaguar through the gates. He jumped out of the car and ran to slam the gates shut. The sirens and the bells ceased, except inside his head. Up at the house, the big dogs raved. Dave closed the padlocks on the chains and slid the bar across. Gifford whirled up and turned the key in the lock again. I'm not rich, he said. No way in the world can I pay a servant $80 a day. 
I'm lucky to have a roof over my head. He pushed his clump of keys into the pocket of a, a raveled brown cardigan sweater and turned the chair so that he faced Dave. Mother always warned me I would someday regret my riotous youth. I do regret it, but not in the way she meant. I certainly do not regret the riotousness. Uh, the motor of the chair whined. It rolled up the drive toward the house that rose high and white among the trees. I regret the days when I lacked the imagination to get up to anything riotous. He stopped the chair and half turned it back. Come along. I'm delighted to have a visitor. It was good of you to call the sheriff for me. I couldn't let anything happen to call like that. My friend Ramon and I favored jaguars in our time. Gifford's eyes were small and sunken, but bright. Ramon Navarro, you know, well, will it shock you if I tell you we were lovers? He looked Dave up and down. That Spruce Brothers, isn't it? He stated it as fact. It was a fact. He nodded. Yes, it suits you. You have a beautiful figure. Uh, when I saw you stop on Lemon Street, I thought you were younger. There's something young about your carriage, isn't there? He turned the chair abruptly and wheeled away up the drive again. Why'd you want the Myers house? A lot of strangers have been stopping there lately. Well, Paul Myers died suddenly. Dave walked alongside the wheelchair. That usually brings strangers. I'm from the company that insured his life. Do you know the names of everyone in Gifford Gardens? Uh, Paul Myers was witness to two years ago to a supermarket holdup. Gifford rolled the chair up the long, easy grade of a wooden ramp to the spindle work veranda. Dave climbed the stairs. He wondered about those big dogs barking inside the house, Gifford said. He was on the television news. That brought him to my attention. The house doors were a pair, each with two tall, narrow panes of glass etched with pre-Raphaelite lotuses. Gifford pushed open the doors. The dogs did not come bounding out. The dogs stopped barking. Gifford rolled his chair into a hallway, spacious and two stories high where a broad carved staircase climbed to divide left and right at a landing beneath a stained glass window. Dogs clawed, snuffled, growled behind closed sliding doors. Dave followed the old man in the floppy grape hat into a passageway beside the stairs. He glimpsed a large, dim room with furniture under shrouds. Gifford told him, I used to entertain a good deal, especially when Mother was away in Europe. She didn't take to my friends. He bumped open a swinging door to a pantry passage. Now that she's dead and out of the way, so are they. He gave a brief hoot of irony. Oh, my dear, what a joke life is. He poked a black button in a brass wall plate. A metal door, whose white enameled bore long horizontal scratches, slid open. This was once a dumbwaiter. The kitchen is below. I adored riding up and down, and it is a little girl. He slid aside a folding metal grill. When I lost the use of my legs, I had it converted. He gestured with the impatience of an old man irritated by his incapacities. Get in, get in. And Dave stepped into the cramped metal box, and Gifford backed his chair into it and rattled the grill shut. He poked a button. The steel door closed. The elevator jerked, thumped began to rise, slowly shivering. That's a handsome young man staying at the Myers house, Gifford said. I saw you talking to him. Who is he? Uh, Mrs. Myers' kid brother, Dave said. I love it. And when they go around without the shirts. He's at a protector, Dave said. Somebody gave her a beating. She says it was her husband. I don't think so. A day or two before he was killed. Did you see anyone stop there? Any strangers? When Myers wasn't at home? He was rarely at home. The elevator jerked to a halt and Gifford tugged back the folding grill. He pressed the button that worked the steel door. It slid back and he rolled out of the elevator. He was always off somewhere in that enormous truck of his. Off to gone for days. They had reached the attic wide and high and gloomy. Also hot, though an air conditioner rattled someplace out of sight. With its quiet whine, the wheelchair took Gifford along a crooked aisle between heaps of packing cases, barrels, trunks, thick with dust and cobwebs. A day followed, dodging the corner of an old yellow life raft. 
Mindred, Gibbard said, I should get rid of that. A young man who lived with me for a time after the war had survived on one of those for days after his ship was sunk in the South Pacific. Once driving to the beach, he caught a sight of that propped outside a surplus store. He got all nostalgic and simply had to have it. I bought it for him, along with the compressed air containers to inflate it. Absurd, still. It made him sleep easier. Gifford sniffed. Naturally, he left it behind when he decamped. He rounded a chimney of rosy old brick and crusty mortar and was in a cleared space that held a four-poster bed with a handsome patchwork spread. A chest of drawers with a cankered mirror and a television set on the wall was a blown-up photograph of Ramon Navarro. Stripped to the waist and oiled, off this space opened the tower room, couch, coffee table, wing chair. A pair of large, expensive binoculars stood on a windowsill. Gifford said, A wife can grow weary of being left alone so much. He leaned the rifle against the chest, tossed the picture hat onto the bed. No wonder she took a lover. Dave stared. Are you talking about Angela Myers? Who else? Gifford smoothed his uncut hair. He nodded. Behind that partition, he meant the one at the head of the bed. You'll find a kit. I do all my living up here. Now, it's simpler and cheaper, and the attic was always the most amusing part of the house. I spent much of my wretched childhood up here, the unwretched part. Old books, old magazines, old steamer trunks, full of gowns and hats. You're sure about the lover, Dave said. Who is he? I was trying to say, Gibbard struggled to get out of the frayed cardigan, that it's odd up here, and a gin and tonic would be welcome, and would you fix it, please? Uh, my pleasure, Dave found the kitchen in a sunny gable. Everything neat and compact. Stove, refrigerator, still sink, cupboards, floor, mopped and wax. He found glasses, gin, ice, and quinine water were in the refrigerator. He built the drinks while Gifford talked on. Wonderful, awful old books. I read them all, no matter how boring. There were tons of yellowback French novels, terribly naughty by fin de ciel standards. With a dictionary, I used them to teach myself French. And when reading paled and dressing up, uh, there were always these windows to watch out of. We were isolated out here in those days, but hikers came, and sometimes lovers. I saw some charming pastoral tableau down among the oaks by the creek on warm summer days at nights. I crept down for a close look. That was how I learned anatomy and physiology. I was keen on self-education, you see. Naturally, I saw some things I ought never to have seen, and that haunt me still. But that is what little boys who prowl and spy upon others can expect, isn't it? I couldn't locate any mint, Dave found Gifford in the tower room, seated in the wing chair, peering through the binoculars, frail fingers adjusting the focus. When he heard Dave, he set the glasses on the windowsill, sat back, smiled, held out his shaky hand to take the glass. There is no mint, alas, in the kitchen garden. There used always to be mint, but that was long ago. He rattled the ice in his drink and sipped at it, dribbling bubbles into his beard. Ah, delicious. He waved at a couch, empire style, covered by a fringe Spanish shawl, almost as threadbare as the upholstery it was meant to hide. Sit down. And Dave continued to stand. You know the man's name? I make it a point to learn the names of people who interest me from afar. Bruce Kilgore. He operates a school down there, under the rubber tree. Gifford gestured vaguely. I believe the generic term for them is a white flight schools. Right. How do you know they're lovers? There are no more oaks for them to make love under. Down by the creek. Dave walked to the windows. They were shiny clean inside and out. How did Gifford manage that? The view was amazing for distance and for breath. Can you see her bedroom windows from here? Does she forget to lower the blinds? <laughs> you ask a good many questions for an insurance salesman. Gifford said, and his sunken eyes bright and curious as a six-year-old's fixed day from under brushy white brows. That isn't what you are. Really, is it? I'm a death claims investigator, Dave said. And when it looked as if Myers had 
an accident, the insurance company wasn't unduly worried. When it emerged that somebody blew his truck up with a bomb, they hired me. You didn't come here to thank me, Gifford said. You came to pump me. And Dave gave him a thin smile. One of the deputies who came in response to your telephone call about my car said you see everything that goes on in Gifford Gardens. You're obviously civic-minded. I assumed <laughs> you'd want to help me. And Gifford studied him for what seemed a long time. He cleared his throat. Uh, she didn't forget to pull the blinds. But he came only late at night when the husband was away. Gifford drank thirstily again. And the children were almost certain to be asleep. What would you make of that? And the night Myers was killed, a ledger lay on the coffee table with stacks of magazines and books, a potted fern and supermarket green foil, an ashtray with a cigarette butt in it. And Dave saw no cigarette pack on the table, nor on the stand by the bed, which held a lamp, a clock radio, a telephone, and another photograph of Ramon Navarro. This one in a tarnished silver frame. The ink of an inscription had faded. Gifford stretched a hand out for the ledger, laid it on his blanketed knees. Turned pages covered with closely written ballpoint script. Aha! Here we are. Night of the ninth. Gifford smoothed the page. He sat straight. His eyesight must have been childlike, too. Unblurred. On that night, she was away with the children. All night. Kilgore did not appear. And Mrs. Myers reached home with the children about 7.45. A sheriff's officers were waiting to give her the bad news. He closed the ledger and gave Dave a smug little nod. I keep written records. The memory plays so many tricks. Thank you, Dave frowned. He used the word came about Kilgore. Is it over? Doesn't he come anymore? Not since Myers died, Gifford shrugged. After all, the beautiful brother is in the way, isn't he? But no, it is not over. They meet at Kilgore's while the brother babysits. Kilgore has living quarters at the school, Gifford said. Yes, as you say. Twice, anyway. Perhaps more. He twitched a smile inside the frosty beard. After all, I am not King Argus of the Hundred Eyes, who never slept. His two creepy clear child's eyes twinkled at Dave. It will amuse you to learn that Mrs. Myers went straight to see Kilgore after she left the house this morning in her waitress's uniform, while you remained behind with the beautiful brother. Uh, what'd you say his name was? I didn't say. For what it's worth, it's Eugene Malloy. And Dave nodded at the ledger. No one came and beat Mrs. Myers up on the night of the ninth. Uh, when'd they come? Who were they? Or were you sleeping? It was two nights before. Gifford's hand strayed across the rough gray fabric of the ledger cover, as if to open the book again, but he didn't open it. He said, I have my own reasons for remembering that night. It was well after dark. A stocky middle-aged woman came in. Two muscular men. She was startlingly well-dressed. They, I think, were truck drivers. They arrived in a van without markings. I can't see license numbers at night. They didn't stay long. Five or ten minutes. When they came out, one of the men was rubbing his knuckles. The next day, and I got a glimpse of Mrs. Myers taking in some dry clothes from the backyard. Her face was a mass of bruises, and she moved as if in pain. Never seen the stocky woman and her goons before? Gifford shook his head. It wasn't her husband who beat her. Why do you suppose she told you that? He didn't come home that night or all the next day until dusk. I gather he was moonlighting. Gifford laid the ledger back on the table. Who was that handsome chap who arrived this morning? Well, you were there. Uh, Spanish, right? What we might call a living dial, might we not? What do you want? And Dave told the old man who Jamie Salazar was. He came to say they have a suspect in the murder of Paul Myers, a recent parolee named Silencio Ruiz. Gifford gasped and stiffened in his chair. Dave said, Are you all right? I live my life in pain, Gifford snapped. So, will you, when you're 75, 
His voice was a wheeze. He gulped feebly and pointed. If you don't mind. The bathroom. Digitalis. A small bathroom backed the small kitchen. A dozen little amber plastic cylinders held pills and a medicine cabinet that also contained a pressure can of shaving cream and a pack of throwaway razors. Day put on reading glasses and found the digitalis. He tapped a pill into his palm. A glass stood on the wash basin beside a box of denture cleaner. He filled the glass in the tower room. Trembling, the old man popped the pill into his mouth and gulped the water. He sat with eyes shut, panting. He whispered, uh, Thank you. I won't keep you, but the keys to the gates are in my sweater. He fluttered a weak hand toward the bed. When you've locked up, throw the keys as far up the drive as you can. I'll retrieve them later. Uh, shouldn't I call your doctor and wait till he comes? It's nothing. It happens all the time. It will pass. You're very kind. Gifford opened his eyes. They were cold. So was his voice. Be careful on your way out of the house. My dogs are trained to kill. The coldness left. His smile was saintly. Thank you for coming to see a boring old cripple. I hope I've been of some help. I appreciate it. Dave dug the keys from the ragged sweater and found his way out. Carefully. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.